I'd like to invite you to close your eyes and come with me on a journey into the future. With your eyes closed, I want you to picture the future of the environment 50 years from now, in the year 2068. What is it that you see? What do you smell? What do you hear? You might be envisioning a lush green field, maybe a dark and fragrant forest filled with birdsong. Or maybe you see a sparkling blue lake and hear the sound of children's laughter echoing as they skip stones across its surface. Okay, you can open your eyes. So you might have been envisioning something like this beautiful forest. But most of us, when we're asked about the future of the environment 50 years from now, see something that looks a little bit more like this. We see images of dystopian collapse and degradation, maybe coral reefs that are bleached and devoid of biodiversity, clear-cut forests, or pavement and suburban sprawl as far as your eye can see. And it makes sense why we think about those dystopian images of collapse and degradation, right? We are bombarded by those images. And the massive, radical pace of anthropogenic change brings serious concern about the future of the planet. But if we merely extrapolate current trends out into the future, it runs the risk of being self-fulfilling. We know that people make choices based on what they believe about society and what they expect for the future. It's like steering a car. You're going to steer towards what you're looking at. So if the only visions that we have of the future are ones that look like this, we are more likely to steer towards those negative visions, even if we know that they're not the ones that we want. I spent the first part of my career working on increasingly precise descriptions of environmental problems that somebody out there should do something about. The problem is, the somebody was always vague. And what we should do about it, it just wasn't convincing. I mean, no one, not even my mom, was reading my scientific papers and saying, wow, Elena, you are so right. I should really change how I'm behaving. I was boring and I was depressing myself, and I had to work on solutions. So here's what I want to say to you today. We can achieve a good Anthropocene. Anthropocene is the name that some scientists use to describe the current era, an era in which humans are a dominant force on the planet. And to me, a good Anthropocene is one that is more just, more prosperous, and more biologically diverse than the world we're living in today. Now, such a future, it's likely to be radically different than the world that we live in today. People might have different values, different worldviews. There might be different cultures, all sorts of different things that affect the social norms and the very fabric of our lives might be different. And the problem is that envisioning such a world, while incredibly appealing, is really difficult. How do you imagine something so radically different? But it's really important that we try. Stories are incredibly powerful to us, and images are incredibly powerful to us. They do help to create our reality as much as they explain it. So when we tell positive stories about the future, they help to create the very future that we're using them to forecast. And I think that those stories that we're telling about positive Anthropocenes, they need to do three things for us. First, they need to illuminate some realistic pathways by which we can get from where we are today to a better future. Second, they need to show us a different place for humanity on the planet. Right now, most of our images of humanity on the planet are either the source of all environmental evil or gods of the technology that are going to save us. But I think we need something different, something more about being a humble part of a bigger biological community. And third, those stories need to inspire us. The work of the kind of change that we need to do, it's not easy, and we're going to need all the inspiration we can get to get there. The global scientific community has been working on developing positive stories about the future, positive global scenarios. But thus far, I think we've fallen far short of achieving those three goals and doing what we can do. Let me tell you a little bit about why. 
I was involved in helping to build the UN Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Scenarios about 15 years ago. And one of the things that we did was we imagined differences between different futures. So here, in this case, a world in which people work together to try to solve their environmental problems, or a world in which rich people build walls to keep out the poor and protect their own. I probably don't have to tell you that the world in which people work together turns out a lot better than the world in which people don't. That's not very surprising, but it's also not very insightful. It overestimates the power of one single change working together to bring about everything that we anticipate or want out of a better future. There's two other problems with the way that we're currently building global scenarios. One is that we tend to follow the same handful of pathways and drivers to the future. So we think that things like technology, the way we interact with one another, how we feel about the environment versus development, that those are the only things that are going to affect how we walk from today into the world of the future. And we end up with the same handful of stories over and over again. And the third problem with the way that we're building current global scenarios is that we think a lot about the end game. So in a positive scenario, we might think about the sustainable development goals achieved in every country on Earth and everyone's living happily ever after. And we spend a lot of time thinking about what that happy world is going to look like. But we don't spend very much time thinking about the pathway by which we're going to get from here to there. And so when it comes to making the kinds of hard choices that we're going to need to make, we fall flat because we haven't thought through what those choices are going to look like. So we need positive stories about the future, but they're hard to build. How are we going to build stories that are positive, inspiring, maybe even radical, fundamentally realistic? That's a lot to ask. I think we can do it by starting with things that people are already doing today to make their communities better. As we look around in different communities, we see that as people are increasingly facing threats to nature and threats to society, they engage in new projects, radical ways of living, new ways of thinking to try to make things better for themselves. And we call those things seeds of good Anthropocenes. And I think we can look to them to help us tell better stories. So my colleagues and I have been working with the Seeds of a Good Anthropocene's idea, and we've used an international participatory process to collect seeds, 500 of them, from all around the world. And we use them for a number of different things. So we've developed a database of information about them, all the information that you'd need to know why they emerge, why do they grow, how do they cause change, how do they inspire change in other faraway cities? Or how do they inspire different kinds of change in, the own city, in their own cities or rural areas where they emerge? And we're also using them to develop a new method for telling scenarios. So let me tell you about two of the seeds, just so I can give you an example, so you can know a little bit more about what I'm talking about. So one happened in the city of Copenhagen, which back about uh, 10 years ago decided that they were going to go organic. They were going to have 90% of all of the food that they served in every public cafeteria be organic, every hospital, every government building, every school. They really quickly realized that they couldn't just serve the same food they'd been serving before. It was far too expensive. They'd blow their budget immediately. So they started to serve different food, less meat, more vegetables. That meant that they could source food locally. And when they could source food locally, that meant they could prepare it freshly instead of having cafeteria workers reheating prepared foods. And that meant more training for cafeteria workers. So what I love about this particular seed is it's a great example of how one small focus change about food led to so many knock-on effects on other th positive things for the city of Copenhagen. And one more example, the story of a group called Health and Harmony. They're a project that works in Indonesian Borneo, where they partner with local communities and they provide low-cost health care in exchange for communities' commitment to reduce deforestation. What they found since 2007, an 88% reduction in illegal logging, complete stabilization of all primary forest loss, they're regrowing 20,000 hectares of new forest, They've protected habitat for 2,500 critically endangered orangutans. 
And even more, they're having a massive impact on human health. They have achieved a stunning 90% decrease in child mortality for children under the age of five. So how did they do this, right? How did Keenery Webb and her team figure out that the way to protect forests was to provide health care? So they did something else that was really remarkable. They invented something that Keenery calls radical listening. They went to these communities and just listened. Tell us, what is your life like? What problems do you face? What's your role in this community? Tell us. And what they heard was people saying, we don't want to cut down the forest. We're desperate for medicine, for our wives, for our mothers, for our children. And that's when the logic connected. We could provide health care in exchange for reducing deforestation. So I love a few things about this story. One of the things that I love about this story is that when I was building the Millennium Assessment Scenarios, it never would have occurred to me to start a story about the environment with fixing human health. And another thing that I love about this story, and one that also wouldn't have occurred to me, is that it starts with listening, with going to a community with humility and asking, what do you need? Who are you? And to me, that's incredibly inspiring. So we're taking seeds like these and many, many other seeds and using them to develop a method to tell better stories about the future. How do we do that? We start with a few seeds, and we ask, what makes these seeds unique? What kinds of challenges are they trying to solve? How are they going about doing it? And we sort of mash them together, and we confront them with the sorts of challenges that we're facing in the Anthropocene, and we ask about how they thrive under those situations. And that helps us describe a story about how we start from the seeds of today and get to a better world of tomorrow. And I think that this solves a number of the problems that we're facing with the current global scenarios. Because they start from things that people are already doing, they're realistic. Because they start with the very interesting and novel things that people are doing, they're radical. And they feature different pathways and different drivers that we never would have thought of on our own. So it gives us something that's inspiring, that illuminates pathways, that's realistic, and that points towards a more positive future. So Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said, if you want to build a ship, don't start with collecting wood, cutting the planks, and assigning work, but awaken people the longing for a wide and open sea. And I think maybe it's time for us to stop cutting planks and assigning work, for me to stop working on increasingly precise descriptions of environmental problems, and for us to start thinking about the radical inspiring stories of the future that might give us hope and awaken in us a great and hopeful longing for a good Anthropocene. Thank you.